Amen. Let's love him again here this morning. We thank you, Jesus. God, less of me and more of you, God. Hallelujah. I need your glory. I need your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated for a moment this morning. Appreciate his presence. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord together again today. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody say the glory. Amen. It's a term that we're very familiar with. We, we use it a lot, but I think that we use it in a not intentional, but a misrepresented manner. Amen. We live in a, in, a, in a nation which, in my opinion, is still the greatest nation in the world. Uh, in America, there is estimated 210 million Christians in America. Now, I think the population is around 300 and some million. So that, I don't know what the percentage of that is, but way the majority of America professes to be Christian. So again, 210 million Christians in America. They say, again, according to statistics, there are right at 380,000 churches of all different types in America, 380,000. So if all 210 million professing Christians went to church, every church would have, on average, about 552 people. Amen. 552 people in every church. Well, again, statistically, the average attendance in churches in America is 65. That's a huge drop from 552. Half of all the churches in America have fewer than 65 people in their weekly worship services. So there's a huge gap, obviously, between those who are professing to be Christian and those who actually show up to church. Amen. Give yourself a hand. You're, you're one of those that has chosen to come to church this morning. There's been a trend in the last 20 years where the average attendance uh, has been cut in half. Uh, the Gallup poll, it's a, it's a, it's a company that, that keeps statistics and has done it for many, many years. According to a Gallup poll, American membership in houses of worship continue, unfortunately, in the late hour to continue to decline dropping below 50% for the first time in the eight decades that Gallup has been uh, keeping up with this information. In 2020, it dropped below 50%. It dropped to 47% of Americans said they belonged to a church, a synagogue, or a mosque, down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. U.S. church membership was 73% when Gallup first measured it in 1937. So it remained right there close to 70% for the next 60 years. And then again, at the turn of the 21st century, there has been a rather steady, rather steep decline going from 70% in 1999 to 47% in 2020. Now, I think we, we can see that trend. Amen. The world we live in certainly reflects that. Uh, there's a lot of components, a lot of factors that I don't necessarily going to, not, I'm not, we're not going to cover that today. I just want us to understand the the atmosphere, the environment that we are living in today. It's amazing how we can adjust ourselves to, to, uh, to live, to deal with, to, uh, amen. And if we're not careful, uh, the, the outside, <laughs> I don't want to use the word forces, but the outside influence can very easily infiltrate into our lives. Now, I realize this morning that none of you or none of us here today would ever consider 
or intentionally think that I'm going to become one of the, I'm going to I'm going to follow that trend. I'm going to I'm going to be one of those that may profess to be something but not show up to church. Again, we're very blessed here to have a faithful poor, and I and I again I thank God for you. I'm so thankful. Amen. We're very blessed uh, to have a church the size that we have. We're not a we're not a large church, but we we're a faithful we're a faithful church, and for that again. I commend you and are very thankful for that. But I want us to understand that even there are, there are those that are not here today that at one point s- s- sat where you sit and they never intended on ever not being here. Okay, Again, that trend, it is increasing in a dramatic rate. Uh, it is again to this morning. I want what I want to share with you. It's my opinion. This is my conjecture, Amen. But we're living in an hour today where there is no replacement for the glory of God. I, I realize over the last twenty, uh, well, the last twenty years, twenty twenty five years. Let's go. Uh, my wife and I, we first started pastoring. It was in 1999. And the, the way that we have church today has evolved. Now, again, I'm not here to say it's wrong or it's bad, but it's different, okay, for sure. No doubt, each of us have our preferences. Amen. You don't have to raise your hands, but I'm, I'm, I know there are some of us here today that we like the old hymnal song. Okay. Amen. And that's preference. And there's others here. If our young people, they're, they're downstairs this morning, but they would say, what's a hymnal? <laughs> they, they don't even know. Now, a hymnal is not like the Bible, okay? It's not like, but again, it's preference. Things have changed. I remember at Marble Hill when we first went there, we had something called an overhead projector. And you had these transparencies sheets, and that's what would throw the words up on the, on the wall, and that was for worship courses, because the other ones you turn to the hymnal, you turn to the number. Things have changed, Amen. And again, I'm not here to critique and to say, well, that's one way is better than the other. Uh, the thing, though, that we have to keep in mind is we're living in a time where there's there's a high value on entertainment. People want to be entertained. That's why our our kind of our our mantra over the last 10 years here has been we're not here to build we're not here to gather a crowd we're here to build a church because a church is not so much concerned about whether I'm being entertained the Bible talks about in the, in the late hour that there would be those who would, 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 would yearn for teachers the Bible talks about having itching ears you know tell me what I want to hear tell me what I what makes me feel good again there's nothing wrong with feeling good. No, but at the same time, I don't ever want to replace that for conviction. Amen. For a time where the Scripture talks about a place to be reproved, rebuked if needed. Amen. Why? Because I want to be where I, want to be where I need to be in my relationship with God. And if I, if I and, I'm, and I'm talking even to myself, you realize a, a pastor needs a pastor too, right? Amen. And so if I, if I rely just on my own self to govern my ways and do what I feel I need to do without having any direction, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Amen. That's the nature that's within us. And so in the, in the modern church that we're in today, and, and I say modern, and, you know, there's, there's, we have now these programs that put the words, and again, thankful for that uh we we have scriptures that are i mean that that part has been good i know it's you know i don't ever want to get away from the the original but but it's so nice to be able to reference to a scripture and everybody's able to have access to it again there's there's pros and cons obviously amen but in the hour that we're in i I don't want it to be something that church is so convenient church is so easy church is something that we you know, kind of fits our self. I, I, I think, again, there, there is a tremendous need that 
amen, that we as a, as a body of believers keep ourselves open to allowing God to, to cut some things away, amen, to convict. Everybody say conviction, <laughs> amen. I, I realize it's been, for me, it's been over 30 years since I, amen, have been, a, been blessed to have received the Holy Ghost. And, uh, amen, that's, you know, 30 years is, is, is quite an quite a quite a amount of time. But even now, 30-plus years later, guess what? I want God to get a hold of my heart. Amen? I, I, I realize I've got, a, I've got a long history behind me where God, and I, and I thank God for that. But even, even if it's 30 years, 40 years, whatever, Lord, I, I, want, my, I want my approach to God to be, Lord, change me. Amen? Put within me a right spirit. Amen. Get, get, create in me a clean heart. Renew in me that right spirit. In the Old Testament, Moses, he was the, the spokesman that God had chosen. Moses was the representative, if you will. He had tr- a tremendous amount of responsibility. There were moments even where Moses thought, oh goodness, why, why me, Lord? Why me? God had chosen him, and it was Moses that would, yes, would be the spokesman for God and the people of Israel to stand before Pharaoh. That was one of his roles, but I would venture to say his most important role was not him speaking to Pharaoh, but it was him climbing up a mountain and meeting with God and listening and receiving the instructions, the the commandments, the word, the Amen. That, that he would receive, and then it would be Moses' responsibility then to communicate that to the people. He goes up, and, up at the mountain. He's there for, I believe it's 40 days. We know what happens to the people below. They don't know where he's at. He's out of sight, almost out of mind. They, they kind of go out of their minds. Amen. They create this calf, this golden calf. Moses comes down, well, his, his time that he had spent on the mountain with God, it, it altered Moses. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 34, it was so that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were, were in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, and Moses did not, he didn't know it, he didn't realize it, but the skin of his face shone, it shined, amen, while he talked with him. The glory of God, amen, which is represented by, oftentimes by light. and We'll we'll get more into that in a moment, but amen, it actually infiltrated, it affected Moses. Amen, you could tell that Moses had spent some time with God. His, again, that reflection of the glory of God was was evident. Now, he, he wasn't completely aware of it, but his face shined while he talked with him. Verse 33 says that when Moses had finished speaking with them, talking about the people, the Bible says he put a veil on his face. Now, I have have preached from this setting of Scripture on numerous occasions, and I have. I have always taken it from the angle that the people were intimidated by the reflection, by the, 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 the glory that was shining through Moses. And so... The need was to put a veil over Moses' face so that it wouldn't make the people, if you will, uncomfortable. And that's really that I, I guess in some ways that, that that can be, you know, that, that can be noted, but Amen, Paul references to this very event in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And his take on this is a little bit different. The Bible says in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Amen. Which notes here that the, 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 the motive of Moses putting the veil over his face was to keep the people from noticing that the glory was decreasing. But the Bible says in verse 14, but their minds were blinded. 
They didn't see it anyway. I, I, I do like what the message says here. Amen. And again, just for context, the message is not a translation, but it's a paraphrase. But I, I do like the way he puts it. Unlike Moses, we have nothing to hide. Everything's out in the open with us. And here, here's what he says. He, speaking of Moses, wore a veil so that the children of Israel wouldn't notice that the glory was fading away. But they didn't notice it. Here Moses has, again, and, and, and we understand it's not putting Mo Moses in a, in a bad light, but no longer, Moses was no longer on the mountain, so he did not have access to the glory of God. And so that glory started to, to de decrease. And so the veil was put there to help to keep the people from noticing that decreasing of that glory. But, but here's the point is, the people didn't even notice it to begin with. Amen. They, they didn't notice that the glory was fading away. I think if, I'm not, if we're not careful, again, in the environment that we live in, the world that we live in, the moral decay of the, the moral fabric decay of our society, and you name it, there's so much going on. If we're not careful, if we're not vigilant, we can become just like those people where we don't even notice the glory is fading. We go through the motions. Amen. We, we get the affirmation from one another. We, we're good people, but we're, we're oblivious to the fact that the glory of God has decreased. God forbid that we ever think we can do this without the glory of God. To think that we can operate effectively without having the glory of God in our lives in our church <laughs> I don't know about you but I, 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 I do I love each of you and I'm, I, I enjoy my time that I spend with each of you I'm, I'm thankful for you but I'm not in this just to have a good social time I love you and I, and I do, and I mean, I'm not here today just because I get a paycheck. <laughs> this is my life's desire. But I'm not in this just to have a good time socially. I'm not in this just to say, man, we got good people, and we do have good people. I'm in this because I want to make a difference. <laughs> and the only way that we're going to have the influence that we desire to have is we better have the glory of God. But if we're not careful, we'll be like the people around Moses that the glory has faded and we're not even aware. We're not even aware. There is a very distinct difference between what we call the presence of God and the glory of God. Now, you could be an alcoholic sitting on a bar stool and have a conversation about God and feel the presence of God. That's not the glory. Now, I love the presence of God. Don't get me wrong. I like to feel the presence of God. But my, my target, what I'm aiming for, is not just to feel the presence of God. The glory, the word glory, it's defined as splendor. Brightness, shining, radiance, a quality of God's character that emphasizes his authority. I was telling the ministry team before service, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm, I, th I, think I've, I think I've got some ADHD. And so I'm good for about an hour and a half to two hours as far as really focusing on something. About that two-hour mark, I've got to unplug. I've got to set it down and, and do something different. To... And so I did that the other night as I was preparing this. I kind of hit that wall, and so I don't know what I was thinking, but I went to Walmart on Black Friday. It was the devil. <laughs> 
And, and again, so I go there. I, it is a little later in the evening, but as I'm, as I'm leaving Walmart, thank the Lord I was delivered, but I get in my truck, and it's like God stepped in the truck with me. And I started heading towards home, and man, God filled the cab of that truck. And, and of course, I had been thinking about this, and I had been kind of just meditating on, on, on this subject. God, I know we've got to have your glory. And I drove through town. I went to every one of your houses. That If you live here in town, I drove by your house Friday night. And I was praying, God, fill that house with your glory. Because if this house is going to be full of the glory of God, it's going to begin because it's going to start in your house. So God, we got to have your glory. There are some, there's some good churches in this town. I'm not here to throw stones at any church. Good people, sincere, means well. Let me tell you the difference, though. One is the doctrine, obviously. I believe we got to have the right doctrine. Amen. I believe we need to we need to teach and we need to preach the apostles' doctrine, being born of the water and spirit. I believe that with every part of my being. But just because we have the right doctrine does not mean we have His glory. And so God, more than just wanting to be different because our doctrine is right, Lord, my prayer is, let your glory make the difference. And I promise you, I promise you, it will. Amen. The presence of God, this is something I, in this morning as I was, again, putting my mind together, my thoughts, and a time of prayer, I, I wrote this down. I said, the presence of God is something that we recognize. Amen. How many here love the presence of God? When you feel the presence of God sweep into the congregation, it is wonderful. And I'm so thankful to feel the pre- presence of God. I'm so thankful that when we come to church, we can feel the presence of God. Amen. Because there are churches where the presence of God is really not allowed to move so much not to have liberty but the glory of God recognizes you we recognize the presence of God because we feel that the spirit of the Lord and 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 that 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 all the emotions that are there and that's 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 wonderful that's fine but the glory of God the difference is when the glory of God manifests it's it's recognizing us. See, God told Moses, amen, when Moses first asked God to show him his glory, God told Moses, you, you, can't, you can't see my glory and live. I mean, the glory of God is that powerful. And, it's, it's, and, and reason for that is because, amen, the impurities that, that resided obviously within the fallen nature of Moses. See, you can't just approach his glory just nonchalantly. Amen. The glory of God, it is. It's powerful. It, again, the definition is it's, it's the quality of God's character that emphasizes his authority. I'm telling you, friend, you talk about reverence. Reverence is a, is a, is a, uh, a, a necessary component or attribute for you and I if we want to have the glory of God. We don't just casually address his glory. Because again, we're, we're, we're dealing with the, God's character of his, that emphasizes his authority. So, so God told Moses, you, you, can't, you can't see my glory and live, and not all of it at least. So, amen, your, your spiritual condition, amen, the, the consecration of my, of my life. Now again, I, I, you may look at me today and say, man, you're, you're doing good, Pastor. You're, you look like you're, you're spiritual. You got your preacher's uniform on. Amen. You got a smile on your face. So, you know, automatically, oh, right, pastor's doing okay. You realize, though, that I could have all this on and put a smile on my face and still not be doing right. You're here this morning, and I can say, man, we're so glad to have everyone here, and, and we are glad to have you here, but to think that just because you're here, you're doing good, that's, that's not accurate. You can be here. You can be a part of us. You can be looking like you're living for God, but deep down, 
you're nowhere you need to be. Spiritually, you're not a consecrated. Amen. And so your spiritual condition, your, your consecration to God, amen, is, is, well, in essence, it determines, if you will, the level of glory. Because God's not going to share His glory just because, I mean, He's very particular. Everybody said amen. <laughs> too many times, or too often, people, and I'm, and I'm not, I'm just saying us in general. If you're a people, this includes you, all right? All of us. Too often, we would rather, we would rather do as Moses did. We would rather mask the glory rather than repent and position ourselves to truly be a recipient of the glory of God. You can't get it any other way. There's no shortcut. There, there's no, well, I'm going to be faithful. I'll, I'll be there every service. I'll, I'm going to be faithful in my giving. I'm, all of that's needed, but that's not necessarily going to be what brings the glory. What brings the glory is a person who says, I am, I am, I'm coming today and I'm ridding myself of the things of this world. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut some things away from me. Why? Because I, I, for too long we've not been a guardian of the glory that we've been given. And again, we've learned that we can exist without it but we cannot exist effectively. Amen. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus took Peter, James, and John on top of the mountain, and what an experience they had. As the Bible says, as he prayed, the appearance of his face, Jesus' face was altered. His robe became white and glistening. Can you imagine? Really, we can't, but... We can try to fathom. Behold, two men talked with him. They're there. One minute, they're starting to have a prayer meeting. The next minute, Jesus is like glowing like a light bulb. And, and then he's talking to Moses and Elijah. The Bible says in verse 31, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep and when they were fully awake the Bible says they saw his glory <laughs> oh God I need your glory I want to see your glory that's why it was Peter, James and John it wasn't the other nine <laughs> disciples amen again Jesus the Lord is very particular on who he shares his glory with. And I'm promising you here today, let me, let, me, let me please clarify that every single one of us can be a recipient of that glory. But we determine that by the way in which we consecrate our lives. The glory. Romans chapter 1. Romans is a tremendous, tremendous letter that Paul wrote. And, amen. Amen. I just listened to Jeremy Painter teach on Romans. Those of you that are in Urshan know who Jeremy Painter is. Y'all need to YouTube the guy. He's, it's phenomenal, his insights. Starts with Romans. Paul's writing here, obviously. Amen. In verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known to God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. The splendor of God is on display for every one of us to behold. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I'm telling you, God's not trying to hide anything. 
He's not trying to disclose anything. I mean, he is on full, uh, he is accessible, and, and he, I'm telling you, he's, he's on display if you want to if you if you want to see it if you want to take knowledge but this is what Paul's Paul's writing he says in verse 21 because although they knew God they were aware of God they knew God they 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 were they were intimate with God but they did not glorify him as God they had this knowledge of God but they they didn't give God, the, they didn't glorify. See, that's why, church, when we come together, I don't care if it's a Sunday, if it's a Wednesday, I don't care what day of the week we're here together. When we come to give God, to glorify God, that's why I'm telling you, and I, and I know that we all express ourselves differently, but there has got to be some kind of expression because we are, we are stepping into the presence of God himself, I want to glorify. That's why we want to be a church that is a worshiping church. Because we recognize this is not just an awesome presence of a wonderful God, but it is the presence of the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And we're privileged to be in his presence today. Amen. But they, they did not glorify him as God. They, they, they didn't do that, nor were they thankful. Oh, God, give me an attitude of gratitude. We had our, our singspiration last Sunday night, and I know we have fun, but God moved into that singspiration towards the end. We ended it with singing that song about gratitude. Lord, I don't have much to give. But my hallelujah is all I really have. I'm telling you, that's all he really wants. It's not about whether you can sing good or not good. or It's the fact that you offer yourself and say, God, I'm thankful for your blessings. I'm thankful for who you are. But they, in Romans chapter 1, were not thankful. But here's what happened. Because they didn't glorify God, as, as him as God they, didn't, they were not thankful the Bible says they became futile in their thoughts their foolish hearts were darkened I'm telling you church you cannot not be thankful and it not affect you you cannot not glorify God and it not affect you you may think well I'm just, I'm just going to be neutral you cannot be neutral in this you, you, you're, you're one or the other now again, I'm glad every person is here today and I think you ought to be here no matter what condition you're in. This is the, this is the best and the safest place to be, I promise you. If you're going to fall, you need to fall into the church, not out of the church. Amen, I'm telling you. So I'm not here to criticize you if you're not where you should be. I'm glad you're here, but I'm telling you, amen, you cannot not glorify God and it not affect you. You can't not be thankful and it not affect you. Because you're, again, they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And here's the problem. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. They generic, whatever the word is, the glory of God into something that they were capable of handling. I'm telling you, I don't, I'll never be able to handle the glory of God. Hophni and Phineas, they were wicked priests. Their dad, Eli, was lazy. We're going to talk about them in next service, but Hophni and Phineas, they were wicked. They got into a battle with the Philistines and they lost. And so they said, let's go get the box. Let's go get the box and it'll save us. And I've often said that you can't have a relationship with an it. They had the right box. What they went and got was the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of the Covenant was 
the, the residence, if you will, of the, of the Shekinah glory of God. I mean, it, they had the right thing, but, but they, they weren't able to access it. Why? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Exactly. Because their condition of their hearts, of their lives, was not in a consecrated place. And no, no matter, you may have the right box, you may have the, all the right everything, but if you ain't where you need to be, the glory of God is not going to demonstrate. But in Romans chapter 1, Paul says they changed the glory of God. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. See, at the core of our nature is selfishness. To be like me. Amen. The Bible speaks of homosexuality as a as an abomination I, I believe it is and one of the components which I've never considered until the other day is that any, in a, in a, the homosexual lifestyle is when you're attracted to somebody that's just like you amen everything's got to be about you you can't even that, again that's why when it comes to the glory of God if I'm going to condition the glory of God into something that is similar to me. Amen. If you if you read the whole chapter 1, you'll find that these group of people that Paul is addressing, they did not have a good outcome. God, I don't want to change your glory to accommodate me. Lord, change me to accommodate your glory. The Bible says in verse 25 that who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Lord, I don't, I, and I realize that the hour we're living in today, amen, there's so many that are doing this. They make it so easy. If we're not careful, we can say, well, I, okay, I, I can kind of join up with them. I, no, 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 no. We got to draw a very hard line says we're not going to corrupt the glory amen God does not share his glory with anyone or anything we're going to land with this first John chapter 3 Bible says behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed on us that we should be called children of God Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everybody say the children of God. Now are we. That's what we are. We're the children of God. Now, what are we going to become? We don't know yet. But we do know, as Scripture says, that we shall be like Him. Can I tell you that if you're not like Him today, you won't be like Him then. Next verse. This is, this is, this is the kicker. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure wait a second if God wants me pure he'll do it no he will not you I we purify ourselves and I promise you you're not going to have no problem in, in, in that process because why your motive is I, I want to be like him I want to have the same testimony that Jesus had when he told Philip he who has seen me has seen the Father. When you look at me, you're seeing a reflection of Him. How could I ever be such a reflection? The glory of God, just as the glory affected and literally altered the, the appearance, amen, of Jesus on the mountain of, of, of transfiguration and Moses as he come down from the mountain. I'm telling you, the glory of God will affect your very everything, amen. 
That's how people will know. It's not because, well, you go to this church or you, you, you wear these kind of clothes or, or you... No, 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 no. The glory of God, amen, will set us apart. But it begins by saying everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself. The reason I don't want to go certain places or do certain things, say certain things, be a part of certain things... You know why? It's not because it's a heaven or hell issue. It's because, you know what? I want to be a guardian of his glory. And I don't need anything in this wicked world infiltrating this heart. Amen? Do we really want the glory of God? Do we, do we really understand the value of the glory of God? Church, I don't want to do anything without it. Moses said, I don't want to, if you're not going to go, Lord, I don't want to go. Lord, if your glory's not here, I don't want to. I'm not saying to be here as a physical location. I'm saying, Lord, if I got to do this without your glory, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. But that's not what we're facing. The fact is, we, we have access, we've been given that privilege. But how much of Him? would we rather have than us Lord less of me and more of you I need your glory let's stand here today Lord we are so thankful God we're thankful for your spirit we're thankful for your word today I pray God is Lord this will take effect into our hearts and our minds